Epiphanies in the process of developing a collective artwork akin to jazz improvisation. Elsewhere, uh, we come across instruction for creating a collective bibliography by embracing chance and venturing forth into unfamiliar stacks, heeding the call of an unfamiliar book. In our essay, Fabiola Naldi contributes a first-hand account of her long-standing collaboration with Fantine shedding light on the spatial and hidden bonds that animate the life of a community. Any reader engaged with a reimagining of future pedagogic ecologies will find these glimpses into the mechanism of shared artistic experience invaluable. Curators Gabi Scardi essays traces the entire genesis of Fantin's practice, pointing to his compulsion for integrating in an unexpected way points of view and ways of thinking considered conventionally incompatible as part of the spine of his practice. Emilio Fantin's voice affords us a much needed glimpse into new and inclusive and radical ways that are exist in the world, can affect change and can contribute in enforcing ways to fields of knowledge not normally associated with artistic discipline. So, uh, thank you for these words, Catherine. Um, um, according to me, you analyze uh, in, in, in interesting way my approach to uh, pedagogy. But I would uh, I would really like uh, uh, to know your interpretation, uh, your point of view, not necessarily um, philosophical speaking, but. Uh, thinking that you, about your experience, because you was part uh, of one of my workshop in La Colemont Foundation. Uh, so what was your experience? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Emilio, for reading my words. <laughs> um, yeah, what I, um, I just want to do, I, I want to make a, a small, like a, a brief plug for this book, especially within the context of, of this conference. Um, I, I, it's, I think it's extremely rare in the context of today to be afforded these, as, as I wrote in my essay, these very detailed descriptions and glimpses into the mechanisms of Emilio's art of conversation, which is a form of, of socially, as we say in the Anglo-Saxon world, um, social enga socially engaged art practice. Um, so I just, I really want to recommend this book, especially chapter four, where there's this huge, it's, it's, it, it's a, incredibly generous um, on the part of Emilio to, to kind of open open the inner, inner mech mechanisms of one of these um, extended workshops. And this is the experience that I had in the south of, um, in, in La Colomón, the, um, the resident, Emilio's residency in the south. Um, what to say, Emilio, um, uh, I, 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 in my essay, I write from, uh, from the experience I had. In other words, um, you enter a workshop with a sense of, um, of being open to share, um, share with others. Um, your chapter, The Poetics of Otherness, really describes this idea. It's not that you are the other, you're the outside, but you're invited, you're invited to identify yourself with others. And that it, that is at the base, that was at the base of the workshop. Um, 
Together with that, the exercises in inner visualization, in particular, I talk about um, imagining the inner the inner life of an olive tree, was especially uh, was profoundly moving. And um, I, I don't know what what else to say, Emilio. I, I write I wrote about it much more clearly than I'm able to articulate at this point. Is is there something specific you you're asking me that I'm not addressing here? You're mute. Just the difference between uh, something written and something lived, you know, what kind of, uh, uh, maybe this can help to uh, understand uh, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to explain the book, just a, a, a witness uh, of, of this uh, relationship between people and and the relationship between the people and the art process and how the art process uh, conducts the uh, pedagogy and and forms uh, uh, kind of uh, exchange cultural exchange you know this yeah this kind yeah. of yeah that that's um it's interesting because in many of your chapters i think that you parse out like through your writing and your thinking you try to get as close as i've ever encountered um in writing about um this the nature of this kind of pedagogy you come as close as as i think any i've ever encountered anybody of of articulating that that you're non-perceptible, that inner, that inner, that space that is in created between people. That's not, it's not verbal. It's not, um, it's not something that you, you, you can put words to it. Um, so the, so there's a big difference between the experience of the workshop and of course, reading, um, reading anything theoretical about the pedagogy. But I would say that, um, that the i what what i found so so enriching for for everyone who who was involved who was engaged with the workshop was that we came in not knowing what what the final result would be and through the experience of living also together within this with this part of the particular nature of the space i think actually informed in, informed the way that we we proceeded and began to to think as as one in terms of um of a final manifestation of the week that's the best i can say it yeah i think place has a lot to do with it yeah Thank you very much, Catherine. Sure. Uh, very appreciated. And uh, I, I pass to uh, Gabby, and um, I'm going to read uh, as uh, as uh, before it, um, an excerpt from uh, the chapter seven, that is the poetics of dreaming. And then I will ask some question to Gabby as well. Uh, so the recognition and identification of connection between what happens during dreams and what happens in waking life are the raw materials of my research, which is part of a wider ranging study on the relationship that exists between sensory perception and inner awareness. It is necessary approach these two aspects through the practice of imagination and dreaming to then sum them up in a single experience that includes both. Imagine, feel, intuit seems to be the words that best evoke the condition through which we enter into relationship with the dream dreamed image which present itself in a dream as it were, uh, if we were physically perceiving it. But imagine, feel into it is also the way through which people who have a shared experience in the recollection of the dream can meet in a mysterious invisible agora. These encounters as 
are ratified and confirmed by real events that establish a dialogue with dreamt events. Each of us interpreting these events will be able to imagine, feel, intuit. Those of the group that are closest to us in terms of elective affinities to seal and a share node in the dense network of paths formed by individual destinies. The experience helps us to become aware of the fact that the relationship between people of friendship, work, politics, social and cultural contact cannot be lived exclusively through the idea of cause and effect. I do something to obtain something else. I implement a strategy to arrive at something. I work to obtain individual gain. So this was the excerpt from chapter uh, seven, uh, Poetic of Dreams. And uh, Gabi, one of my first work uh, uh, was an installation curated by you uh, at uh, the magazine uh, Center for uh, Contemporary Art uh, uh, in Grenoble. Uh, since that uh, moment, uh, I started to inquire the uh, relationship between uh, the uh, reality, the physical world, and the uh, and the dreams. How do you see this? Uh, how do you interpret this relationship? I think you unmute. Just unmute yourself. Et voilà. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, thank you for waiting. Thank you for uh, introducing me, uh, Emilio. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you. Yes, this, uh, so this, uh, the interest of, uh, for dreams is a very long uh, interest, it's a very long term uh, focus uh, in your work. Um, and uh, it's really central. And, uh, and, and, and I think we can read it in different ways. It, it has different uh, meanings. One is um, the fact that um, what Emilio does is uh, exploring and trying to understand uh, life in depth, uh, which means uh, understanding uh, behavior, understanding how we relate with with the uh, with reality, how uh, things happen, time, how we change, we transform in uh, ourselves, we change in time and we transform reality at the same time uh, around us. Uh, but most of all, how uh, reality is very layered and fluid and uh, it encompasses uh, different um, dimensions. And so in order to understand all this, uh, Emilio is trying to uh, a reach that region of ourselves or of, of uh, uh, humans uh, or living beings, maybe, uh, where our deepest um, consciousness resides. And this is why he's looking in different uh, states of consciousness and uh, sleep and dreams uh, are among the most important in this sense. But at the same time, this region, uh, the, the region of dreams, for instance, is not separated. There are no boundaries. It's a continuum. There is a continuity between the day life and the night life and the dreams life and what happens while we uh, sleep. Uh, everything is woven together. Uh, with ordinary life, with dreams, uh, dreams are rooted in uh, in reality. Uh, um, <clears throat> they are linked to circumstances, uh, and 
at the same time, very important, they are shared experiences. And this is important because uh, uh, one of the mottos uh, of, uh, of Emilio since, uh, since many, many years, decades, is uh, dreams are common to, um, to all. Uh, which means really that uh, dream, dreaming is, a, is, a, is a, um, an experience common to everyone without exception. Um, and at the same time, it's individual par excellence. Um, so it, uh, the work um, ends up by conveying a public uh, dimension. So it's very private. It's about the very private, the very uh, subjective, the, the, the most inner uh, uh, part. And uh, at the same time, it's about what we share. Uh, and this is quite uh, disrupt disruptive, I think. Uh, if we consider it um, in relation to the way we live, where what is public is public, and there is really a separation between our uh, personal life and the public life, and uh, uh, and what we live and perceive, and what uh, uh, the 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 aim, how we have to, uh, the function of our um, public um, uh, life and actions. Um, so this is one of the, I think this is one of the, um, uh, of the issues. Uh, and in fact, what happened in, uh, in this first uh, exhibition at Le Magazine, which was uh, in 1999, so, a lot of time ago, uh, it was that uh, it was involving the um, the the dream uh, dreams dimension of um, people subject, who were working together. Uh, so they had a professional relation, and suddenly the other side of uh, of their life and personality and. Uh, uh, was uh, would would come out um, uh, and and this was very there was like a, a, a tiny a, a camouflage it was uh, the name was not mentioned but anyway uh, it would be possible to recognize the voices um, and so uh, and this idea of the two dimensions suddenly coming together. Uh, was quite um, it it quite uh, it was quite explosive in that uh, situation. So this is an example example, and then there were many um, uh, many um, workshops and uh, uh, exhibitions that um, involved collective experiences of uh, dreaming, dreaming together, talking about the dreams. Uh, sharing the in sharing uh, the moment of uh, sleeping, uh, um, uh, and the role of Emilia is always this kind of uh, meiotic um, uh, role, kind of meiotics of dreams. Um, and I think this has can have uh, social socio political implications. This is a quite a um, involves a, a critical position, uh, looking for a common denominator, first of all, and, um, and uh, yeah, also dreams are not linked to the functional, they are dream, uh, linked to something totally uh, different. So jumping from one dimension to the other uh, and, uh, and uh, involving different people in these uh, common experiences, uh, is uh, I think this is uh, quite an interesting uh, aspect of Emilio's uh, work, and the idea that uh, the uh, they like um, dimension, time, uh, situations, and uh, the one of the dreams are uh, absolutely interconnected. 
uh, and we are done by the two uh, components together. Um, I think this is this is an interesting um, uh, side part of the of Emilio's uh, work. Okay, thank you, Gabi. And and now I'm I'm passing to Manish, and I will read some uh, an excerpt from uh, chapter two, Socratic Poetics. And then I will pose you a question. Within my practice, the pedagogic and artistic are inser uh, inseparable. One is a function of the other and both contribute to the constitution of my work. Thoughts intersect between people who meet, who speak and who listen to each other embodied in limb while simultaneously nourishing an intangible dimension of feeling, imagination, and visions. This interweaving of individual thoughts gives life to a whole that persists through memory and feeling, even when people are far away from each other or no longer exist. A whole that welcomes everyone, living and dead, in a continuous dialogue between present, past, and future. From our awareness of this proximity, which is not only physical, we find the strength to feel the other. Is the right not obliged by necessity to put himself in his reader's shoes? Is this sense of belonging not proof of the existence of such a whole? This sense of the shared led me to pay particular attention to the meiotic relationship as a natural consequence of a non-top-down relationship that set the condition for exchange between experience and enthusiasm. This type of exchange, which can take different forms, such as workshop, residency, and collective experiences, is an, art an artistic process through which an encounter with the idea of consciousness takes place, where the individual can measure themselves in the context of collective body. To grasp the latter is necessary to circumvent the former without excluding the contribution of the individual to the collective. So you, Manish, your various activity uh, as uh, activist and organizer, Shinkshanta, uh, Svaraji University, Ecoversity, inspire me and prompt me uh, to have uh, a, a new, a different uh, idea of education. Uh, in my book, I try to, in a way, uh, to analyze, to define the relationship between pedagogy and art. How do you see this relationship? Um, yeah, thank you, Emilio. It's so wonderful to be here with you and uh, bringing back, just seeing you, bringing back so many memories of the times we spent together. So it's thank you. and. Uh, I'm very congratulations on the new book. Also, it's uh, I, I uh, uh, hearing you, but also I had a chance to look through it, and also it was uh, very exciting. Some of the things I was seeing there, and uh, very important work I think for our times. So I think you know the one one the comment about that, as I wanted to say, was that you know, this. Um, I see that part of your work is around actually reimagining the individual. And this modern modernity has put us in a box of of the individual, and that, in its ugliest senses, show up in this kind of now these identity politics and the way that, you know, uh, people are cutting and and canceling each other all the time. Uh, 
So I think that, and, and the kind of fragmented, hyper-rational individual that was created over the last few hundred years is this, what you're doing is, and, and your experiments have really uh, opened up a new way for us to um, uh, rec reclaim something beyond the individual. And I think, uh, you know, I agree with the previous speakers, it's a very political project that you, you've taken up and not only a pedagogic one, but a political one. And these, um, these other modes of perception that start with something like trust or with intuition uh, might be, you know, something that we really need in the times we're living in. I think the Ecoversities project is also trying to open up, um, start with the idea that, you know, um, the way we're, we've been trained to think about ourselves and about life and about the crisis is all part of the crisis. And so this, this um, openings you're giving us that consciousness is something much more than, I think, again, it's been a lot of people are said, oh, it's what happens in our brain, but it's not actually that, it's much more, it's extending, overflowing beyond our, our our heads and in, into our bodies, into the, the the into these these entanglements and engagements with other beings and uh, objects. Um, I think this opens up a lot uh, for us to uh, access, and and particularly, you know, the the idea that um, we're being told we're alone all the time. You know, this is one of the the deepest, darkest. Uh, lies of, of the modern capitalist paradigm as we're alone. And uh, I think that deep loneliness, uh, what you're doing is actually helping us um, transcend that and move beyond that to something much more uh, powerful. And I think, you know, what I, what I have always appreciated about you and your work is it actually, you know, this, um, the, the notion of art as a, as a, something to be consumed is a very, you know, again, um, capitalism has put it art even in a box. And so your work of trying to break art again, or help escape, uh, help it, it uh, escape from the jail that it's been put into uh, is, is very powerful for us to see art as a tool, even beyond, I think, pedagogic, pedagogic, uh, you know, a lot of pedagogy is, what, what other speakers have also said is that, you know, it's not something that we're, you're not trying to control or trying to drive in a certain direction or, you know, like w there's a one moral of the story to be discovered from uh, going through one of the things, but it open it gives openings to different kinds of openings to different people who experience it. And I, re I remember that we had, when we were in Italy at Free Home, the, this death Death Walk that I think you had helped organize and lead. And that was for me, one of the super powerful experience of all night. We went in the middle of the night and invited um, people who had passed away for a walk uh, and a, and a intera in, in interaction. Uh, and I think that, that uh, the potential to, you know, open us up to, again, the, 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 to worlds that are not just defined by, you know, a certain dimension that we've been confined to is very powerful. And, and the healing capacity of it, the imaginary capacity of it is very, uh, very much needed in these times. And, you know, the, I think a question which, um, which I, which I am myself have been exploring and trying to, is this connection to reconnection to the sense of sacred or a sense of, of something that is, we, we may, we can say the source, a higher source. Um, and so I think your experiments are helping us in different ways to, to not just theoretically understand it, but to actually embody it and to open up, um, you know, many modes of perception to, to, to uh, re-sense into that connection. So thank you so much for, for sharing this and I'm so honored to be part of this journey with you, Emilio. I'm hoping our paths keep crossing over and over again. Thank you, you Manish. Uh, very appreciated. Your words uh, touch me. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I I will now I will pass to Crystal. Uh, I'm quoting an excerpt from uh, a dialogue we had uh, a month ago, and uh, that is published on the book. Uh, so he is an neurointensivist, and uh, he represent can i say like that Christos, the the scientific uh, part of uh, of this uh, dialogue in a way and but uh, we had a, a very interesting dialogue because the the topic was the consciousness and uh, he has a, a lot to do with consciousness in his work but differently from my work so it was very interesting i read just uh, a couple of uh, of uh, answers so uh christos let me press you a little more on this point i want to better understand what you mean and why you think so i am rephrasing a bit but i think the deeper point you are making is that understanding c that means consciousness we require more than what in general we call scientific methods it is because for science to investigate a phenomenon the phenomenon has to be physical or wholly material in other words is your point related to the debate between physicalism or materialism and substance dualism and along this question are you suggesting that c consciousness may be related to a different immaterial substance another way to pose the question is to ask how you understand the relation between the physical and the mental or the brain and the mind and my answer this question leads me to considerations involving the history of knowledge and in particular the relationship between matter and spirit before the scientific revolution research proceeded in two directions an empirical direction capable of proving physical phenomena and another direction that uh, uh, ident identified physical phenomena as effects of planetary order of growth that govern nature and the existence of higher beings this isn't a question of dogma or forcing reality in an attempt to adapt it to religious doctrines but rather of maintaining sensitivity capable of interpreting existence both from a rational logical approach and as well as an intuitive and imaginative approach and this means appealing to the insight that emerge from listening to one's own interiority we think for example of figures like Giordano Bruno or Wolfgang Goethe the first, as we know, was burned alive by the Inquisition for his anti-dogmatic ideas. The second, without undergoing persecution, consistently maintained an attitude of deep spirituality while not adhering, adhering to any religion and never denied the analytic and rigorous nature of scientific research throughout the entire history of the humanity except the last three centuries knowledge was conceived as a double track in which empirical experimentation engaged with esoteric knowledge handed down in texts the scientific revolution has changed this relationship by tilting the balance toward everything that is experimentally verifiable verifiable this led to research entirely dedicated to the study of matter a physical phenomenon weight ratio i believe that even if it is no longer possible to retrace the path of goethe and bruno we can still draw some lessons from them 
first of all, that matter cannot be considered as an end in itself, as a mere agglomeration of substances, but, ma ma but must also be seen as a result of living forces. And the knowledge of these forces can be imagined or into it in their qualitative, qualitative extents, not weighed. We know, for example, that in cases of comatose patients, the possibility of perception and reaction are zero. And yet doctors advise re relatives and friends to hang out with patients, talk to them, to cook for them, to live as if they were at home. There seems to be a positive effect on the patient himself, but it's not known why this happens. If there is a positive effect, there must have been significant reaction, sorry, must have been communication, something that interfered with the patient. Since no significant reaction are reported in the tools that detected cognitive activity, then this passage of information must, must be attributed to something else. Is it possible to imagine something communicable beyond the reason itself? So my question is, uh, Christo, uh, how we can take in account uh, uh, scientific and, and poetic approach uh, on the theme of the consciousness? Emilio, thank you very much for having me in this company. I, you know, I have to say um, uh, I, I'm not used to be in conversation with artists and art scholars so this is a delight for me um and uh, i hope that your book reaches a wider audience i think there are uh very interesting uh and rich ideas here and i think they can i think they can speak to beyond art uh you you discuss consciousness uh in a rich philosophical way uh i think your ideas and your work is relevant both um, both for the medicine of consciousness, but also, I think, potentially for the approach to the patient with disorder of consciousness. And, um, you know, to frame a little bit further, I think my my answer to you, uh, you know, I want to I want to say that I come from a very different world. I am a clinician um, who cares for patients who have brain injury. Uh, and I tend to see them early during the injury when, when they are in a coma. So, you know, I, I thought I knew what coma is, but after exposing myself to some of your work and some of your ideas, uh, you know, I think I, I, I question a little bit the, um, the very strictly like scientific or, or neurologic framework under which we operate when we see these patients. So this is more of a general uh, remark. Um, I, I think you were asking about the connection between uh, how can art maybe enlighten uh, our approach to, to the comatose patient or to the individual with disorders of consciousness. And I, th and I think, you know, there are, there, are, there are several things that can be said. I think one, one point um, that strikes me as important from you know, reading various experts from excerpts from your book is that you you talk about coma, which in medicine, in clinical neurology, is defined basically as the absence of consciousness, lack of consciousness, right? Um, without defining consciousness at the first place, which is kind of interesting because consciousness becomes this mongrel term that people use in different ways, but. For clinical neurology, what, what coma is, is, is basically the lack of arousal and the lack of awareness, you know, as simple as that. But you are talking about coma as a state of consciousness, um, right? So you're making the point that, you know, potentially we should be agnostic about what exactly is happening there. Maybe, maybe 
defining it as the lack of any experiences, as I'm sorry, as the lack of any experience closes off some interesting potentialities and some interesting possibilities. Uh, and some of that turns out to be true in a scientific way, if you like, because now we know that patients who appear to be in a coma from, from lack of behavior, uh, they tend to harbor, if you do brain imaging, for example, uh, let's say an MRI or a more sophisticated imaging technique, or you do electrophysiology, like you know, a specialized DEG, it turns out that indeed these patients are in some way experiencing some mental states, which, which are hard to describe. Okay. Uh, and so I think uh, that's a very important point that I take out of, from your work and possibly opens up some, I think opens up more possibilities and opens up the very strictly scientific way of thinking about, about consciousness and, and the lack thereof. Um, the other thing I wanted to say without without keep blabbering too much um is you know the 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 video and here i want to actually thank catherine because catherine made me aware of your work and invited me to your to the siamani uh um video presentation at the logan center um but i you know you're you the reason why you call these survivors you know these patients we merge right we merge from coma uh, you're calling them siamans because um, you think that they went through basically through the threshold between life and death. So, so the lack of experience, the the fact that they were in this state that we call coma, uh, is potentially one way of thinking about death, right? And 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 in a and in a literal way, almost uh, they they came from from life back to death. And you're suggesting that. You know, there is a lot to learn from this passage, and uh, uh, and and I thought that the you know the video presentation and their words were very powerful. I mean, both in an interesting philosophical way, you know, that somebody narrates their experience through a period that there is no experience, right? And also in a therapeutic way, um, meaning that uh, you know, narrating such a personal traumatic event. In a, in a public arena and in a theatrical uh, mode, I think it's therapeutic both for the individual who went through this, but <laughs> it also communicates powerfully uh, to, to people who, you know, they have been through traumatic events like this and maybe they haven't had the avenue to express themselves. So I I'm going to stop here. I, you know, I, I, I hope this was semi-coherent, but um, but I'm 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 you know I'm gonna read through this. I hope more people do. Actually, I want my colleagues in the clinic to take a look at how people that do not have the same frame of mind, like the medicine neurology framework, how they think about the topic. And I and I really hope that we keep collaborating and and maybe bring some of these ideas to have an impact in, in the care of patients with coma and disorders of consciousness. And thank you again for having me here. Uh, thank you very much, Christo. It's, uh, you know, your discourse uh, touched me because uh, um, I really want to continue this dialogue. It's very important. Um, according to me, is uh, we have to try uh, to combine uh, a different point of view, different uh, approaches. This is the way to uh, create uh, uh, maybe new or different situation that help will help us to uh, understand and, and and maybe to find a way to heal and maybe to uh, know something by ourselves, of ourselves. And so thank you, thank you again for, for... And uh, well, you talk about this video and I, I have, um, I wanna show you, I wanna screen a couple of video that is not the one that you mentioned. The, there are other two videos that have been made uh, um, in the 
a special situation in collaboration with uh, the Amici di Educa, who is an association uh, located in uh, Alla Casa dei Risvegli, Awakening House, where people that come with consequence uh, uh, of coma uh, leave their uh, rehabilitation. And uh, so uh, it's, there are two very short video, it's kind of portraits of Claudio and Simone, two uh, different uh, cases because uh, Claudio uh, had a stroke. He was a, a theater director and in the video, he dialogue with the, the actor that, that uh, worked with him before the stroke. And Simone, who was uh, a punk a bestia, I don't know how you say in English this, this, uh, this, uh, well, punk a bestia, it was a, a rebel, someone who lived in, in the street and um, happened that some other people, I, we don't know who, um, beat him in the head with a wooden stick and uh, he fall in coma for 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 months and uh, he woke up uh, completely paralyzed uh, tetraplegic so uh, but let's let's see this two video and and then and then maybe we leave uh, the space for question or comments see my my can you see the black uh, screen yes yes we can Okay, so we start. Quanto ti piace pensare anche senza fare? Per solo un passo. È più difficile pensare, fare o sognare? Forse sognare. Bisogna essere vivi per sognare. Abbastanza. E bisogna essere presenti davanti agli altri? O si può essere anche davanti agli altri senza farsi vedere? Si può ogni cosa. Si può tutto. Che bello. La tua onnipotenza. Ognuno di noi può fare tutto. In ogni momento. Non ti fa paura? Eh, un po' sì. La paura ti aiuta? No, la paura mi accompagna, mi segue. Posso seguirti per tutta la vita, anche se non mi vedi? Posso seguirti anche in tutte le altre vite, per favore? Ma volentieri. Volentieri detto la parola voglio. È possibile che noi siamo quello che vogliamo, cioè quello che sorvoliamo, quello che vediamo dall'alto. Possiamo avere anche dei pezzi di cielo, per favore. Possiamo. Ti ringrazio del tuo infinito. So this was uh, uh, Claudio, and now I'm gonna uh, look for Simone.
I think you unmute, Emilio. Um, I'm, I'm saying that the second video is, is by Simone. They wrote the text and perform inside an installation that I created for the occasion. And uh, we had a longer relationship and I told them, you know, you, you can elaborate, uh, you can make whatever you want, you can say a story, a, a dreams, a poetry, and Simone told these poems that he um, composed uh, when he was in love with this girl, and uh, he cannot move, I mean, he moved just one eye, and uh, he, he, he cannot also speak, uh, he make verses or noises that uh, some of the people in the structure, medical structure can understand. After a, a month, I also understood him. Unfortunately, now he cannot even make these verses. And, uh, but uh, I find, you know, it's, it's so strong it, 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 in this uh, body completely uh, uh, without any hope. Uh, there is a, a force of, of, of life that uh, heal me. So uh, for this reason, I, I, title, I title the other film Shamani because I find that uh, these people who touch the, the treasure of the death and they come out from this experience so badly, I mean, with uh, terrible anomalies and they have a really a strong force, uh, the force of living that I never see in, in other, other persons. Well, to come back to the book, uh, of course, uh, as uh, uh, Christos says, I'm also uh, talking a lot about state of consciousness. And, uh, and I consider the, the coma uh, situation, as, as Christos says, as one of the state of consciousness. Because, uh, by the way, I 
I, I consider consciousness as a, a sort of, of uh, fluid, uh, of, of entity in, uh, in which we, we, to which we belong and uh, participate in it. So there is, yes, of course, an individual consciousness that uh, allows us to be here in this space, in this time, and uh, uh, controlling the, the different physical input and sensorial inputs. But this is just a detail, a particular state of uh, um, a wider concept of, of consciousness. So I'm, I want to, I don't want to talk anymore. I leave you the word if uh, someone of you has something to say or some question or or comments even. Uh, I don't know how long, how much time we have. We have uh, more or less 10 minutes. Hi. Hi. So, sorry, um, I missed um, the beginning of your talk, but thank you so much for sharing your views because um, I've never seen it before and this is quite personal, but I have an aunt who when I was five was in a terrible train crash. She was in a three month coma. Um, so I'm curious about your point um, that Manish Manish, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. So, you know, gracefully put in the chat um, about this idea of the shaman um, in that force, because I grew up with my aunt and I watched her, um, you know, learn how to walk and talk again. Um, actually, she did remember a song. Um, I also watched my family, you know, really work together. Like, for example, my grandmother. So there's there's two things. My grandmother every single day when she was in a coma read the Xinjing, which is a Chinese um, script, and at the same time she received. So it was a big case internationally because it was like the first time Chinese medicine and Western surgical methods were put together in a big case like this. And she had acupuncture and massage every day during her coma, um, and they even like dripped down Chinese herbs and then helped her swallow, like massaging it. Um, so when she came back, however, she has severe brain damage, and one of her symptoms is she cannot control her hunger. Um, there's no physical space for hunger in the body or the brain, um, so it's a very strange phenomenon for the doctors. Um, she had to replace her skull, and her whole left side of her body is, is you know, a little bit damaged, but in terms of, like, the psychological thing, this hunger thing is really, it was really difficult growing up because, like, you know, it was just like she couldn't like food is like you know she would wake up in the middle of the night and like come to my room and be like where are the food you know we would have to hide in there's like different fridges and like you know i'm uh, so this idea you know to me and and so now it's been 20 20 years and she sorry, she still lives with my grandmother and my grandmother every day still has to like you know do this whole dance with the food and like give her this and like hide the food and it's like a whole thing you know because no one else can help so I you know I want to understand more like what do you think is and I think my grandma she's 86 now right so she's really like what what is the purpose of this she's like I wish she, she would constantly call me and be like oh I wish like we didn't save her you know like she would she would say all of this and it would break my heart but like I don't know what to do and um so i'm curious like what you think you know her message is that she's bringing like i don't know what it is and i i i constantly think about this actually uh, i i think uh, uh... Maybe someone else can answer you better than me, but but I think uh, um, 
these are very, very difficult proof that we encounter in our life, uh, especially with parents. And uh, I think we, we have to uh, consider that life, uh, it could be very hard and uh, it could uh, hurt us uh, in a different way. But uh, there is a, a, a kind of, of uh, to me, I think there is a kind of drawing which uh, in a way direct people and we really cannot understand what happened and why someone or some other get uh, an, an accident or, or a sickness and uh, and maybe also it's difficult to understand the relationship that we have with that sickness or uh, or accident uh, but uh, I think we can try to uh, see this drawing from the eye and uh, and uh, and uh, believe that there is a, a reason, a, a good reason is difficult to say, but there is always something that work for the world, for the well, for the, this direction also in, in these cases. So um, I told you, I, I am really uh, grateful to these people that I met and, and I work with them because they teach me this. They teach me that there is always a direction, always a hope and always a, a force uh, to live and to, and, to, and to communicate and to stay with others. So I, I hope you, you will find a way uh, as thank you yeah i think i'm inspired by the idea of art as a means of healing and i think i'll definitely have to sorry i got so emotional um but i really have to think i think about it more thank you for that thank you you Kristen, do you have a question? Hello, thank you so much for this conversation. And thank you, Vanessa, for your, um, what you just shared. I just came off of a year of caregiving for my own mother. Um, I'm, uh, I was so moved by that, those two videos that you shared, Emilio. And um, I'm curious about the elements of your installation, the layers of veiling going on, and in viewing it, um, the question came to me if these, you know, these new ways of describing what could be consciousness, could this potentially lead to new descriptions of what is touching, um, how we touch each other? Uh, there's physical touch, but um, the last video, Simone, I think you said the name was, you know, missing, you know, the regret of not being able to make love again. That's so, you know, being inside of his own body and expressing that, that's, uh, that really um, is something I'll be thinking about for some time, but I'm just, that idea of touching each other and these different modes of consciousness, I'm, I'm thinking about that and wonder if there's any thought on that. Thank you. And if it's if there's not any thought, we can move on. No, um, I think I, I I like to 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 think that uh, this relationship uh, uh, with these people. 
and uh, not only with them but uh, with people that have uh, extreme experiences uh, they are um, really um, powerful in the sense of uh, um, an artistic collaboration they have a lot to, to say to give to 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 express because uh, as i told you before uh, the body is is gone in a way but but the consciousness come up and show up and uh, and you can feel it you can see it you can and of course there is always uh, uh, the suffering her or his suffering but also yours because you know the relationship is but um I, this is some an experience that uh, uh nourish, nourish me nourish me and i think uh, it's it's important to uh to work on it wow well. Uh, thank you very much, Emilio. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining this session. Uh, just massive big up to Emilio and the work that you've committed to and all the other people in the space. Uh, thank you for, for inviting us into this world of the non-perceptible and really providing a massive evocation. Uh, yeah, just saluting you and offering gratitude for the work. Um, I would invite us all, yeah, I'm just going to ask you to put the link in the chat. I would invite us all to move and to share uh, the movements of our thoughts, our bodies uh, in the, and continue the conversation in the chat below. Uh, we're going to be closing this session now uh, and creating room for the next session. It's going to happen in about two minutes time. Uh, thank you everyone for joining the session. Thank you for being part of this and lots of love. Ciao a tutti. Ciao Emilio. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Grazie, yeah. ciao, ciao. Ciao. And thank you again for being here. Thank you. Ciao. Hi, Dan. Are you on uh, uh, Hello. Mm. Let me pass the button. Okay, I'm leaving because I'm getting my makeup on. Yeah. Oh, your session's coming up. Uh, three. It, it's a couple of hours still. Hour and a half. Oh. See you guys. Oh. You, yeah, you. Yes, yeah, you. Thank you very much for your support, brother. No, let's talk soon. Yes, let's yes, yes. We talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. We talk. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Of love. Nice to see you. I think it's the first time we're seeing each other here. Yes, yes. Nice to see you. Love your bow tie. Uh, oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> really, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with the station. I had a technical bug. Uh, which I think I manifested. Uh, however, I was supported by Yayo and Camilo in with great care. And yeah, so super happy. Uh, and yeah.